uh, something else about that. There is the moment where it becomes barbaric. It becomes actual barbarism, not just at the level of practice, but the level of ideas. Um, by which I mean, uh, I don't know if you'll notice this, that when they build up to the Iraq War, um, a large number of intellectuals, people like Christopher Hitchens and Michael Ignatieff, were extolling the virtues of some sort of Jeffersonian empire, you know, an empire for democracy. Um, and what we'd go in there, uh, uh, what we'd do is go in there and basically uh, would bring uh, a massive humanitarian shipment of uh, food uh, and laptop computers, uh, Hitchens said. Uh, actually said laptop computers and he, said, and he boasted about a 2024 site. Um, yeah, so, um, but noticeably after the war had begun, and after it started to degenerate an occupation, people like him started to reach for the most barbaric rhetoric. You know, cluster bombs are actually quite a good thing. You know, go through one guy and out the other end and go through another guy. You know, uh, Michael Ignatieff started to defend torture. Sam Harris, uh, I don't know why on earth um, he is, uh, you know, uh, esteemed by liberals here, but I mean, he has, you know, basically as um, as an Islamophobe, uh, has has you know, more or less defended uh, the most extreme acts of empire, including torture as a, as a form of collateral damage. In other words, there is a phase through which uh, liberalism goes when the uh, ungrateful natives don't do what they're told. Uh, and actually start to resist empire, then they turn to um, these ideologies. The, the implicit chauvinism and racism comes much more to the fore. So um, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, um, you know, that, that is roughly the outlines of what I would say. Um, the debate about the exact relation between capitalism and imperialism is not going to be settled here, but I will try. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I know. I mean, the, the, it is confusing because, on the one hand, I want to talk about capitalist imperialism uh, since the American Revolution, and before then, I think you could talk about capitalist imperialism uh, in Ireland. Um, you know, because uh, England was a capitalist state; it was practicing a form of empire. In the Marxist tradition, when we talk about imperialism, we tend to talk about that which began roughly in the latter half of the 19th century in terms of inter-imperialist rivalries uh, leading to the sort of colonization of Africa and so on. Um, and so there's some ambiguity about what proceeded before then. Um, the precise relationship between capitalism and empire, uh, I would say, is this. I mean, you have um, uh, practices uh, of um, empire which are quite different from what we understand today. Like, you know, you have the Ottoman Empire, you have the Holy Roman Empire, and so on. You have forms of overland or overseas uh, territorial uh, control uh, of people which um, transcends uh, any incipient national um, sort of uh, divisions uh, and which um, you know uh, you know basically results usually from conquest from uh, sort, of, sort of military conquest and that's built into the feudal mode of production because uh, you know the the feudal certain lords I mean they produce for consumption they produce for their own luxury consumption rather than to reinvest uh, in a sort of expansion. And so they didn't tend to make a habit of improving their productive capacities. And so when they wanted to grow, the best thing they could do was go and try and take land from their neighboring sort of lords. And so there was these constant wars of expansion. And when capitalism takes root uh, in a, a sort of given uh, sort of society, England obviously, in the early modern period, um, it takes over that sort of that old form of empire, that old form of imperialist structure, and turns it into something completely different, um, because then you start to see the development of national states, which I hadn't had before. Uh, then you start to see, um, you know, the development of uh, a, a, something called race consciousness, the idea of whiteness. You know, uh, very importantly in Northern Ireland, where I'm from, you know, uh, in, in Ireland as a whole, uh, the English start to develop um, a technique for. Um, depriving uh, uh, indigenous uh, Irish Catholics of the rights uh, and civil liberties to which um, uh, English uh, sort of workers and peasants had become accustomed, um, and they did so on the basis of a sort of racializing gesture. They, they, these guys are inferior, you know, uh, they they are culturally backward and so on and so forth, and they are not really fit for these sorts of rights, um, and that uh, preempted and pre. pre presupposed in a way, the kind of development that we saw in 
uh, uh, North American colonies. So there's, um, I would say, a, a, relation, a relationship in terms of um, not, uh, it's not simply that capitalism is opportunistic and uh, takes up any structures that it finds and tries to put to, towards the purposes of the further expansion and augmentation of capital, but rather that um, you know, the, uh, the, the capitalism has its own sort of tr dynamic uh, towards uh, imperialist conquest, um, which uh, takes on a specific form, um, because you know it creates um, the very basis for uh, nation states um, as independent centres of capital accumulation. Just as at the same time, it creates the the, the tendencies towards expansion, which exceed those uh, those sort of national boundaries. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it creates that sort of uh, new relationship uh, between space and politics, um, which is um, uh, not there in the in the feudal era. Um, there's a lot more that one could say, but um, I, that's roughly the dynamic that I would sketch out. You can sort of quiz me on it if you want. But um, um, on the elaboration of um, you know the relationship between empire and day-to-day -day life work as well. Um, I mean, I mentioned the forms of repression uh, that you have, um, and one could mention the forms of culture uh, that it develops in terms of uh, the, the incredible relationship between Hollywood and the Pentagon and the military machine. Um, but actually, I think in terms of um, the domestic class structure, it's quite interesting. I mean, after, in the post-World uh, War II period, uh, I mentioned the labor bureaucracy was basically annexed by the empire, uh, and a large section of the liberal intelligentsia was. What was the material basis for this? What they said to them, and, and they, they, the union leaders were, and bureaucracies were quite open in stating this as a rationale. American workers will get higher wages uh, through uh, if America is able to export these uh, its methods of production. Um, and develop, uh, uh, you know, American leadership, uh, which is the tradition, traditional sort of euphemism. So, you know, you've got in the post-war period these New Deal intellectuals in the state, in the American state, creating this global architecture of um, sort of, you know, uh, international law and of uh, trade organizations and so on, uh, which enable them to export um, the Fordist mode of production that they have been, the Fordist model of uh, production that they have been developing. And the American labor, the promise to American labor is that if you support us, not only in this regard, but also in our resistance to communism, and if you forswear communism yourself, you will get constantly uh, higher wages. You will see increasing wages. Um, and you will be protected from the worst effects. And what that means, of course, is that the, um, the effects of capitalist scarcity or of uh, market failure can be externalized somewhat if you're an empire. You can shift it down and out. Um, the effects of capital's precarity can be experienced by other people outside the empire. I'm not claiming, by the way, that ordinary working class people benefited from uh, imperialism. I think it's very important to say that that's not quite true. Actually, it's kind of similar to the way in which relative advantage worked in the Deep South uh, for white workers. I mean, over the long run, white supremacy diminished the bargaining power of both black and white workers. Uh, but actually, because white workers had a relative advantage over black workers, because they had more political rights, because they had more money, relatively, um, and because they had seniority in terms of jobs, you know, skill became racialized, uh, you know, rather than being a, a, an attribute of uh, a, social, a social aspect of, of development, it actually became a racial aspect. Um, uh, because of that, it, it, you know, they, they felt themselves to be part of the system uh, that was exploiting them. And that was, uh, you know, really, I mean, the southern plantation owners treated them like shit. Um, uh, but nonetheless, they felt part of that system for a long, long time. And uh, empire had a similar sort of cohere cohering effect. It was part of uh, a set of techniques, I would say, but it had a similar cohering effect on American society. Now that's not necessarily been the case in America since the 70s that the you know that wages have been you know constantly improving. That's absolutely not been the case, uh, you know. And for that reason, I think um, there's been a lot l less of um, sort of uh, conformity, uh, and certainly you know the organized labor movement, to the extent that it still sort of exists, um, uh, is um, you know has has basically not been uh, sort of mobilized behind empire. 
So uh, there are always consequences, uh, not just in terms of you know, the cultural forms, the political forms, the modes of oppression that develop out of empire, but actually in terms of the basic class formations that make up day-to-day -day life and the kind of coalitions that you can build in any, at any given moment. Um, and that's something um, that we should be aware of. On the um, question of um, uh, an analysis that you mentioned, yeah, I agree with you. It's um, it's wrong to uh, sort of have this reductionist analysis that imperialist uh, interventions are always about you know getting material resources. Because I remember the arguments about the Kosovo War. You know, we had people in our country, uh, left wing MEP called Glenis Kinnock. Uh not that left wing to be fair, but uh, you know, relatively, um, saying, well, I support this war because there's no oil in Kosovo. Being the uh, logic being that, of course, America w couldn't be self-interested if there wasn't any oil there. And Chomsky had a good answer to this. You know, I mean, America nearly devastated Nicaragua. Was it for the nutmeg trade? You know, I mean, it, the, America's uh, material interests are not reducible to direct. Uh, never mind economic interests, but direct. What 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 the kind of economic interests you're talking about are kind of like uh, rent and plunder. You know. I mean, America's interests overseas are not reducible to that, and are not as vulgar as that either. I mean, actually, I agree with you about the Gramscian thing, and I'll come back to that. But the, um, I think the important thing is that, uh, that, you, that you alight on, that it's very important, is that imperialism fundamentally changed in the structure in the 20th century. And part of the reason for this, um, and I always mention this in the talks, because it's something that um, you know, is, is, is really important to this story, is the geographer Isaiah Bowman. Um, I mean, he... Um, was uh, employed by the uh, Woodrow Wilson administration and by the FDR administration. And essentially the idea was, uh, what we want you to do is go out there and um, uh, devise for us uh, a method of dominance uh, that will be efficient and sustainable in the long run. I mean, obviously that's simplifying, but that's roughly the mission, the brief that he had. And he came up with the answer, again simplifying, uh, that uh, we can move beyond geography. We don't have to do it like the European colonial empires have done. As long as you actually control the uh, flows of value, the flows of money and profits and all the rest of it, and the circulation of commodities, as long as you control the markets, you don't need to control the territory. And actually, you know, combined with that was, of course, the experience in, uh, in Haiti and Nicaragua, um, and negatively, the experience in the Philippines. Uh, of building up, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in Nicaragua and Haiti, building up sort of national security states, gendarmes, you know, um, which uh, would uh, work as client regimes of the United States and keep order for the United States without the United States needing to exercise direct territorial control or have its military exposed to risk. Um, so, you know, imperialism fundamentally changed after, uh, after as a result of that. And then, of course, the FDR uh, defeated the remaining isolationist uh, segments of the US ruling class, those section of the segments who might have been once upon a time part of the anti-imperialist league. Uh, FDR outmaneuvered them in the late stages of World War II. He saw that the European colonial empires were falling apart and ordered a massive escalation in the build-up of uh, you know, military weapons and tanks and uh, aircrafts and so on and so forth in order to uh, claim those old territories, uh, but not to claim them for direct colonial rule, but rather for that traditional so-called so open-door policy. Uh, they would, in other words, e exercise political control of the regime, um, and over the long run they would see the benefits in terms of uh, the transactions that would flow from that, the access uh, of, of US capital and so on and so forth. Uh, as regards the intervention in Iraq, um, I think the Gramsci analysis that you mentioned is very important. Because I think uh, any argument that starts with this war is a war for oil uh, is going to run into a difficulty. In what sense was it a war for oil? I mean, really, the, the oil companies didn't get control of Iraq's oil in the sense that uh, what one might have thought. Uh, I had the same thing about Afghanistan. You know, there's the pipeline being built through Afghanistan. And uh, it's going to, to take the gas from one end to the other, and that's what NATO are interested in. Next thing you know, it's the Asian Development Bank that's going in there to fund that gas pipeline. The Americans, yeah, I mean, they're interested in this sort of stuff. I mean, how could they not be? Uh, but they, they, that isn't the sole basis on which they would decide to fight and win a war. Um, and I think that, um, you know, if, if you wanted to secure oil resources in Iraq, uh, you could have made, they could have made peace with Saddam. 
it wasn't uh, you know he wasn't a threat to them he wasn't even you know shaking his fist at them really um, so there are other all sorts of ways of doing it I think um, you have to see the war partly as a domestic thing uh, I, I I mean I'm not you know taking the stance that uh, international sort of motives have no role in this I do think the oil spigot matters I do think it matters that uh, they wanted to send a message to the rest of the world as in you know uh, America fuck yeah um, <laughs> Again, that's a scholarly, um, <laughs> but you know, essentially saying you know uh, that um, we uh, can do this, and you can't do anything about it. Because I think Bush and the neocons really wanted to break with the sort of multilateral um, sort of traditions, and really wanted to say to America's allies, "Look, we don't fucking need you. You know, we're, you're fighting with us over the World Trade Organization. You're fighting with us over uh, various issues to do with beef hormones and whatnot." Uh, you know, we're having these disagreements over what will happen in the European Union, but we don't really need you, and we can, you know, give you the bird if, need, if necessary. So, you know, do as you're told. So there was an element of that, but I think that those ends could have been achieved by other means. I think what was decisive was that temporarily the Bush administration uh, had uh, what would, uh, in Gramsci in terms, be called a, a little Caesarist moment. That is, they temporarily achieved a moment of autonomy from the class forces that they traditionally represent. I mean, I don't think the US ruling class was ever really 100% behind the Iraq war. Actually, I think large sectors of the ruling class were deeply hostile to it, and others deeply pessimistic. Of course it's true that once American troops are involved in a war, they would rather we stayed and finished the job if, if it can be done, because the, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of um, uh, the legacy of defeat can be extremely costly, but before the war, it's quite clear that there were large sections of the American establishment, not just of the um, sort of business elites, and you know, you could see this in the way the media was uh, sort of divided, but actually sections of the military establishment, sections of the CIA breaking away. You know, these are not anti-imperialists. Um, you know, so there was um, a, a lot of division, and the, there was a lot of power hoarding, institutional power hoarding within various sites of power dominated by the Bush uh, sort of clique, by the neocons and so on. So I think they got a temporary uh, uh, sort of basis for launching something uh, aggressive. Uh, of course it's quite, quite correct that this extrapolated from the tendencies that were already imminent in Clintonite imperialism, you know, in terms of unilateral action, in terms of uh, defying the UN, in terms of um, being able, to, being willing to, t to bomb countries that uh, thumb their nose at America over weapons or something, or allegedly do so. Um, all of these tendencies were already there in, in Clintonism, but the point is that the Bush administration wouldn't have been able to do what it did had it not been for that moment. And also, it wouldn't necessarily have acted on it were it not to, uh, to have brought certain domestic consequences. I mean, the ways in which that war enabled the Bush administration to push through policies that, um, you know, this really began, I think, in 2001 and came to an end in 2005, um, but they, they started to push through a whole series of policies that they'd always wanted, which increased the ruling class's power and advantage over American workers. Not just changes to laws, like repressive laws, you know, with the Patriot Act and so on and so forth, but with changes to social security and changes to tax, changes especially to the tax system you know, which were extremely important uh, for the Bush administration. I think they would have liked to have uh, privatized Social Security on the back of this, and I think they tried. They failed, uh, for obvious reasons. But uh, the, the point is that, um, you know, uh, th that there are, there's no simple, um, I, I would be uh, resistant to any attempt to explain this in terms of, you know, let's go in and get the oil, or let's go and grab this material resource. I think there's, um, uh, a, media, a, a series of mediating factors. I mean, it's always mediated by politics, it's always mediated by the kinds of coalitions that can govern a uh, rule of society, and it's always mediated by the kinds of um, ways in which interests themselves are represented, not just uh, ideologically, but at the level of politics. So, um, yeah, I agree with you, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, we're going to try and wrap up in about half an hour, just, you know, we give our speakers some time to eat before he heads on. But um, let's take a few more questions. Curry in the back. Yeah, um, if you'll allow a brief comment and question. Um, just on the, on the 
the matters that you were just discussing, I, I appreciate and agree with um, the points about U.S. imperial policy being mediated by, by all sorts of contexts, the context of politics, of uh, what's happening domestically, and so on. I do think it's important to retain the idea, to, just to respond to the original question, of, a, of a, struct, like a, a, a structural analysis that sees imperialism as fundamentally rooted in competition between nation states. I do think that it's important actually to, to retain that. That doesn't mean that every imperial adventure is about directly invading a country to seize its resources. But I do think that if you look at what's happening um, today, actually yesterday, Leon Canada, the Defense Secretary, announced some, some shifts in the US's tilt toward Asia, which is, to, which is all about competing with China, which is the, the, the main US, um, the, the main world power that rivals, or potentially rivals the US. Because of that, they're putting 60% of US warships in the Pacific Ocean, um, and so on. So in, even going back to 1898, if you read the Treaty of Paris, you know, it doesn't say that, that the U.S. wanted the Philippines to seize the natural resources present in the Philippines, but it was very explicit about the need for coaling stations, which are about, as, as Richard talked about, um, the Chinese market and so on. So even, even in things like interventions in Haiti and Kosovo and so on, to take a step back, I think that it is, you can see a bigger dynamic of competition happening that explains the nature of, of even even small policy. So I just I think it's important to pay attention to the trees, but also to step back and, and there is there is a forest that I think is fundamentally about about um, inter interimperial competition. My question is about uh, the anti imperialist league, knowing very little about it. Um, was it of a mass character? I mean I, I know that there were some prominent figures in it, but were there like meetings in cities around the, the country? Under the banner of the Anti-Imperialist League, um, what, what, what did it look like? Were there what was what did membership in it look like, and, and what did activity look like? Yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned a couple of things about uh, particular, <coughs> sorry, particularly uh, the labor bureaucracy and the you know, ruling class. Uh, William Colby, a former director of the CIA, uh, wrote a book. Uh, Lost Victory, where he explains uh, the role of the FLCIA in uh, Europe uh, supporting democratic uh, Christian uh, trade unions because of the uh, instability and the threat of communism. Um, in Latin America, actually, the FLCIO helped to create these centers for labor administration uh, and all these regional uh, reformists uh, linked to uh, the FLCIO and American capitalism and the local uh, uh, intermediate uh, capitalists. Um, in terms of imperialist intervention, also uh, the imperialists intervene in terms of uh, stability, as for example, because uh, they fear that uh, instability will uh, alter the imperial and uh, international capital soldier. As for example, uh, the example you bring, Kosovo. Certainly after the fall of these uh, Stalinist uh, regimes, there were uh, rebellions against uh, the states. You got these uh, unstable uh, bureaucrats that now don't know how to rule, that they're repressing, and the imperialist powers uh, fear that all the instability uh, will uh, alter the geopolitical economic uh, order. So they are, one of the things they, res they uh, resort is to uh, military intervention in order to guarantee uh, stability. Uh, in terms of also uh, in the Iraq uh, wars, for example, although yes, I mean, it's not like a definitely point of uh, finding which uh, capitalist class, etc. We know that as uh, figures of the uh, American uh, imperial state were, were divided, like Colin Powell uh, versus uh, so and so, uh, uh, Brent Scowcroft, and you know, people like that. But, uh, you know, and uh, the point of oil, probably uh, there is some, you know, dark issues about it. It's not like crystal clear, although, like you said, ultimately it's involved. But also the uh, military industrial complex is involved, which is a part of the imperialism, mm -hmm. is part of capitalism, is a monopoly. And actually, in the doc even in the documentary of uh, uh, Fahrenheit 9-11, you see uh, Bush Sr. 
uh, going represent, uh, to Saudi Arabia representing the military industrial complex of uh, general dynamics and uh, you know these capitalist imperialist corporations such as uh, Boeing, uh, McDonald's, uh, Donald, etc. They do benefit from war. They do benefit from uh, imperialism. Uh, it's a constant, uh, you know, uh, capitalist uh, production that also involves uh, international division of labor. What some people, I'm amazed that some people talk about the Paris Treaty only mentions the Philippines. Actually, the Paris Treaty, the United States uh, obtained Puerto Rico, which is uh, mm -hmm. the American most important uh, economy. I mean, uh, so, uh, I mean, and, uh, uh, the, the American imperialists, since uh, John Adams, were talking about Cuba and Puerto Rico as part of a geographic importance in the sense of uh, military uh, positions against uh, the other empires. Last thing is uh, about the, you have a point in terms of, uh, yes, imperialism has uh, dynamically changed uh, since uh, the later part of the latter part of the 20th century, but also imperialism has been forced to change. As for example, the American imperialists helped the, Vietnam, the French imperialists to uh, uh, win a war in, in Vietnam. I mean, the United States gave uh, all, I mean, I'm sorry, all the uh, aid, in, a lot of the aid of the Marshall Plan given to France was involved, it was sent to Vietnam. I mean, and, uh, the French uh, certainly uh, had uh, colonies like Algeria, and the Algerian people waved a war against the, the French and the, the British imperialists in, in Singapore and all the, and, uh, the Federation of Malaysia, you know, all these uh, neo-colonies and colonies in the direct sense the European has. And I still, you know, some of these countries, uh, like in Guadalupe, the French is uh, they're having a direct colony that uh, in the general strike there three years ago, mm -hmm. the French sent a foreign legion troops, although direct colonialism has diminished, but still the point that I'm trying to make is also exists in, in a minor degree. So, uh, yeah, I'm throwing that out. Thanks. Claire. Um, I know that you, you you're more interested in the past, but I just like I'd like it. I'm not that you're more interested in the past. The 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 the, the, uh, the topic today is about the past, but I, I'm really interested in hearing what you think of the situation in Europe right now. Considering that, it, 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 when I look at this historically, it's the sort of situation that could have in prior times, given the uh, pronounced failure of the institutions on several level levels, national, multinational multilateral, uh, the failure uh, on those levels to, to sort this thing out, the fact that they won't be able to resort to war um, to, to solve this, um, it, it kind of speaks to me, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it creates a gap in, in, in the analysis of imperialism, you know, where this thing could possibly go in terms of a possible resolution, assuming there is one, or without a resolution, what, what do you see kind of happening. Uh, I, thank you. Um, is there anyone who hasn't gone? Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that you were talking about uh, with, in terms of the liberal justifications for um, imperial intervention was um, the role that racism plays um, in that, and you know, whether it's, uh, um, well, and so I guess I had a question about how that how uh, anti-imperialist movements have taken up the question of racism historically, um, which is to say, like, like racism towards you know the, the indigenous like indigenous populations um, of uh, um, which are you know which are being invaded. Because I think what right now one of the you know, one of the key tasks of, of anti-imperialists today is to take up the question of um, of Islamophobia to link arms with. Um, you know, with resist, you know, with with um, with Arabs, Muslims in the United States, um, at, you know, as as well as um, uh, uh, you know, and just like standing up to the, the kind of Islamic uh, Islamophobia um, that's being put forward by um, by you know by the ruling class. Um, but there's also an interesting thing I think about the present moment, which is that as more and more populations have moved to countries like the United States, and there are now significant Group minority groups within the United States, like it seems to me that that's actually somewhat of a new phenomenon within anti-imperialist anti movements. That 
for instance, in, in you know, just to, to make an extreme example, in 1890, in the 1890s, there wasn't a significant Filipino population, for instance, for anti-imperialists to link arms with. Um, so I guess you know, I just I was just wondering how those kind of dynamics have played out over time. they like you know, whether it's just like anti, the explicit anti-racist anti arguments, or it, whether they existed or not um, over over some of the history of American anti-imperialism, but also I think um, the way that some of that might play out today. I'm going to just give Richard some uh, time to uh, answer these questions, then we can uh, wrap up. We have like less than half an hour. Okay, let me see what was that. I agree, by the way, about the structure of uh, imperialism being, I mean, we cannot lose sight um, in the sort of, the, if you like, the Gramscian analysis of the uh, shifting coalitions and uh, uh, tactics and uh, power blocks that uh, sort of are, are able to occupy the state. Um, uh, you know, we can't lose sight of the fact that there is a, a fundamental structure of inter-imperial competition. I mean, the whole thing is driven by competition between the, the major capital states and it's competition over access to resources and markets and labor. Um, so I think that's very important. Um, I suppose that, I mean, the only point that I would make about that um, is that when it comes to things like Kosovo, I mean, actually, I think what, what was most important for Kosovo and what was dominant was uh, the idea that uh, America, I mean, I think uh, some Clintonite uh, foreign policy pe people actually admitted this, that really um, we have to keep Russia in its place, you know. There's a chance that Russia will start to expand uh, westward again through new alliances. And uh, Serbia, you know, the, the sort of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia was going to be very important uh, for um, uh, the Russia for that purpose. So going in and inflicting a political defeat on Serbia, um, and creating this Kosovo statelet uh, was one way of controlling the, the instability um, to the advantage of uh, the U.S. in that context. But having said that, I mean, of course, it is true to say that the Republicans opposed that policy. Now, I don't think that was just opportunistic. I think it has to do with the fact that there were certain sections of capital who thought that, that was a complete waste of time and reckless. Why are we bothering with Haiti and you know with uh, Bosnia and Kosovo when we could be uh, you know investing in some real foreign policy decisions like uh, taking on China? You know, I think they thought that to be far more important. So um, it always comes up to the point that it's always again mediated by uh, sort of political representation uh, and by uh, coalitions and struggles uh, of that time. Um, on um, the question of the anti-imperialist league that you mentioned, you asked, is it a mass organization or what kind of organization was it? I mean, yes, I, I, I actually think if you look back, you find it has chapters all over the place. It does include African Americans. I mean, it's not like they're not members. Um, uh, they're very important, but they're just not allowed to run anything or have to have any say in the organization, um, uh, which, I mean, I, I'm, sh I'm sure that's uh, not a problem that's been completely extirpated. Um, but the point is that, um, you know, the, the, there was a mass base to this organization. It's just that the mass base was passive, or at least was expected to be sub subordinate, um, because everything was subordinated to winning uh, battles among elites, because it had an elite uh, sort of, uh, it was dominated by elites. So, um, you know, you could find that it had chapters all over the place, and you could find that um, those chapters were quite well attended, um, uh, and they, they would have annual conferences. Actually, I think the basis of the Anti-Imperialist League was um, sort of, um, you know, I, I think the heartland was Boston. I mean, it was really around sort of Boston and the whole New England area that it really built up its forces. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, it, it was a, a very broad uh, organization, as I say. Um, on the um, question of the um, uh, the fall of Stalinism and the um, instability and the way in which um, the sort of imperialism tried to manage that. I mean, obviously I agree with uh, what you're saying about the, the way in which the, the, the collapse of the Stalinist bureaucracy has created this instability. But I think it's kind of interesting uh, because, uh, again, this is something that's quite revealing about the structure of imperialism. Because you, you had at first, um, I think, uh, you know, US policymakers weren't that obsessed with Yugoslavia. It was Germany, you know, because Germany was uh, had you know was undergoing reunification, you know, it was undergoing expansion, 
maybe the old taboo on uh, military um, sort of strength was starting to be pushed away. Um, and uh, it was going to be, it, it was the dominant uh, sort of, um, I think they always say that uh, Germany is the workhouse of uh, Europe and uh, France is its political master, and that's sort of the division of labor. So the two kind of complement one another uh, in making up the axis of European power. But uh, Germany was, uh, you know, the first in there with the recognition of uh, Croatia and, you know, with um, um, the recognition of uh, Slovenia and so on. So the, um, the, the idea, their, their, and their basic uh, objective was to create um, a series of states who were effectively um, beholden to German capital, who would be open to German capital, and to, not just to German capital, obviously they operated in a sort of hegemonic faction, which means they looked out for their allies as well. Um, but the point is that uh, they, they were creating a network of states in the new sort of Eastern Europe who would be open to uh, you know, capitalist uh, investment from Germany. Uh, at the same time, there German was such... Germany is an imperialist power. Sorry? Germany is an imperialist power. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I agree, absolutely. Okay. But my point here is that there were other imperialist powers who had other ideas about what should be done. I mean, I actually think there was serious divisions between France and Germany and Britain over exactly how to handle this. And then, you know, the United States again, um, you know, was, uh, you know, there were, there were divisions between them. I think it's very interesting that you have, uh, even within the other imperialist metropolises, the reproduction of a certain uh, contradiction created by uh, this inter-imperialist competition, competition, by which I mean that within those societies, um, particularly in the European societies, you get a pro-American faction that's very profoundly pro-American, and you get uh, a section of the, even of the ruling class, that's actually a little bit, well, we don't have to be too much up the American offices, do we? Um, you know, I mean, we have this um, in, uh, the, you know, uh, the UK with the sort of neoconservative right um, that uh, tailed the United States. But also in, the, in France, you know, with that section of the French intelligentsia around BHL, um, you know, pushing for an American policy in Libya, very importantly. Um, and uh, Bernard Henri Libby, oh, um, who was, um, he was uh, once a Maoist intellectual of sorts, and uh, uh, like many Maoist intellectuals, he um, ended up on the sort of, um, well, he basically he ended up on the anti-communist uh, side of things. Um, uh, he became one of the major so-called new philosophers who were devoted to a reheated kind of Cold War anti-totalitarianism. And uh, you can guess the rest. Um, <laughs> um, the, 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 the other thing that you mentioned about the military-industrial complex, I mean, this is uh, endlessly interesting to me because it's, um, the, com the question of really is what, what, do, what happens when, a, when a, a state spends as much money as the US does on armament spending, you know? Um, because this is, I mean, it's by no means a simple question. I mean, I, I know that, um, you know, historically, there is a Keynesian argument which says, well, it has a multiplier effect. In other words, you invest in military production, it gives people money, they spend, that creates more industries and so on and so forth. Um, there's another aspect of it which says, well, it gives them an, an ability to plan to, to a certain extent what's going on in the economy because they've got such a huge lever over the economy. If you can uh, fluctuate what you spend on uh, defense and the military, you can have some sort of effect on economic growth and the upswings and downswings and so on and so forth. Um, there's another argument which uh, would say, you know, that uh, defense spending is good for growth uh, over the long run because what it does is that uh, it stops the overaccumulation of capital. I mean, if you're, invest if you're investing in means of destruction, that's, you're not investing in the means of the production uh, of, of goods and capital and so on and so forth. Uh, and so it has a t certain offsetting tendency to, towards uh, these crises of overaccumulation that we have. But actually, there's a slightly complicated side of this because in post-war Japan, I don't know if you're aware of the growth statistics. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Japan and Western Germany, both of them had clauses, you know, basically, you're not allowed to produce arms. Well, 1% of your GDP, at most, you can spend on arms. But really, it wasn't, you know, they weren't allowed to be imperialist powers. Japan was. Sorry? Japan was allowed to, it actually had, I, I, if, if, I'm, if I'm not wrong about this, they were different than Germany in the sense that they were allowed to, the, um, they were allowed to maintain some sort of military investment. I'm not 100% sure. One, one percent of their GDP was the limit. In Germany wasn't. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't want to interrupt, but my, my understanding no, I, I, was that 
Japan had a, a, a something that Germany didn't have? Well, 1% of GDP actually, pretty, just in, in historical terms, just to put it concretely, um, before the Cold War, 1% of GDP on military wouldn't have been actually abnormal. That would be normal spending for a state. So, I mean, allowing them even to have that is sort of okay. allowing them to have some sort of military. Okay, thank you for clearing that up. I apologize for interrupting. No, 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 no problem. Um, but the point I was, I was going to make, actually, is that um, it's uh, it, it, the fact that they don't have this tremendous um, sort of drag on productive investment allowed them to grow by leaps and bounds. So it's very complicated, this question of arms spending. Um, or the, the roles, you know, each imperialist country at the same time plays a, a role. Like yes. the United States assumed the, 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 the role of the, the you know, military, global, yeah. you know, sheriff. Even on behalf sometimes yes. of the, their competitors. Well, I mean, so as a role uh, in production, you know, yes. of weaponry. I agree, I agree. But I'm just saying that these strictly economic effects, if you will, of um, uh, arms spending are not, you know, they're, they're not predetermined. In some cases, it can be quite bad for an economy. Um, and um, uh, the, the U.S. government found this out, uh, you know, in the latter stages of the Vietnam War. Um, uh, and that's one of the reasons why defense spending went down, actually. Um, you know, it's, it, you're having the same problem uh, in this country with um, uh, the criminal justice system. I mean, I, I know it's an analogy, but it's one worth making. Um, e even Republicans are now starting to say, well, some, starting to say this thing has to be reformed because it costs too much. And it's the same basic principle with any kind of uh, massive state outlay. Uh, it can be, you know, can potentially contribute to growth and give the state considerable, uh, and, it, and it creates interest. It creates cent uh, sort of uh, certain rentier uh, groups within uh, capitalist society, um, and therefore it, it has an internal drive towards war. But uh, I would also say that um, it's it, 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 to, to use um, a, a sort of uh, the, the lingo, it is um, contradictory. Um, it's ambiguous, um, and, and it can have uh, ambivalent uh, effects. Um, I, I can't go on forever, but I have to talk about this question of Islamophobia since it's been mentioned because it's absolutely crucial. Um, and really, um, oh, hang on, I have to deal with your question as well, sorry, um, uh, the, the question of Europe as well. Um, yeah, I mean, the European crisis is, to a very significant extent, a crisis of imperialism. To what extent? Well, uh, the European Union is an imperialist formation with a very clear quasi-colonial dynamic internally. In other words, it's got a clear hierarchy of states in which Greece, and in Italy and Spain, and well, to lesser extent Italy, but certainly Spain and Greece and Ireland and other peripheral economies are um, sort of dominated by Greece and France and the core uh, sort of Eurozone. Germany, you mean Germany? Did I say? Yeah, Greece and France. Uh, yeah. The Troika. That's the second day in a row I've made that sort of yeah. confusion. Oh, um, right, so Germany and France, um, uh, you know, dominating these uh, peripheral uh, economies and, uh, you know, basically using them as export markets and expecting them to drive up, uh, you know, um, I I their, their indebtedness so that they can, pardon me, uh, so that they can domestically hold down their own wage bills and therefore increase the profitability of their, their own capital. So, I mean, that is a classic imperialist formation, but it's also imperialist in another sense because the European Union uh, even though politically and militarily its strength has never really been realized, I mean, its potential strength has never really been realized, it's always remained divided, um, it has nonetheless had a, an important role to play. Um, I mean, I mentioned Libya. You know, it's very important for Sarkozy that he was exposed, the extent of his um, relationships with the uh, Tunisian regime after it was overthrown was uh, exposed, and he, was, uh, and he lost a lot of ministers. He was very embarrassed by this. So uh, I think he decided, in effect, never again. We are going to, uh, uh, you know, position ourselves uh, in the region because France has a lot of interest in the Middle East. We're going to position ourselves on the side of those more moderate, conservative, and bourgeois reforming forces. In other words, when there's a rebellion, we will try and appear to be on on its side rather than uh, sort of backing up the dictatorship. And when the Libyan revolt came along, <laughs> he sent over BHL. Um, to negotiate with the rebels um, and, you know, basically um, uh, sort of come up with some idea of France leading a European intervention. I mean, most of uh, the, the, you know, the other European powers wouldn't have the military hardware that France has, but they might throw their political weight behind it. 
And it was that was very important in terms of inciting the State Department to actually finally sign up to the analysis of people like um, Susan Rice and Samantha Powers, who'd been pushing this argument for a long time in the State Department, and Hillary Clinton suddenly says, oh, right, we're going to have to act. So, uh, and, and, when, and it's when Hillary Clinton decided that they had to act that Obama changed his mind, you know, because he'd previously been listening to the real politickers who were saying, we do not want another land war in the, the Middle East. Uh, so, um, there, I mean, there, there is um, an imperialist intention and an imperialist competition uh, that is happening uh, in terms of its intention outwards, beyond the European Union, certainly in the Middle East and beyond, um, in terms of access to labor markets and commodities and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And its crisis um, is uh, undoubtedly one uh, and, uh, of an imperialist uh, formation and therefore um, the question of whether it can be resolved through war is extremely important. Well, I mentioned one of the ways in which they could try to overcome these uh, problems through war, but uh, obviously uh, that was, um, a, a, if, you, if you like, a sort of a contrived, uh, improvised response to a sort of revolutionary situation in the Middle East which can't necessarily be reproduced. Um, the real problem for them is that they, uh, you know, the, the European Union's um, masters uh, still want to compete with the United States on a global scale. And in terms of their sheer economic clout, in terms of their scale, they have the ability to do so. Um, the problem is that the, they, they still lack the political unit, unity uh, necessary to achieve anything like, to, to even punch at their own weight. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I think that they will continue to try to resolve it in the terms uh, of the sort of Mercosi consensus. That's breaking down. The problem for them now is that when that breaks down, we know that uh, the IMF are quitting in the wings to actually step in, as they did in Italy, um, with their own set of solutions, which are slightly less uh, dogmatic and, uh, and austere, I have to say. Um, but nonetheless, that competition over what exactly is going to happen in the European land mass itself um, is, is ongoing. Um, okay, so I'll finish on the question of Islamophobia. Um, and uh, the, really, the question was how have anti-imperialist movements dealt with the question of racism in the past and really I suppose what can we learn from that? Um, I, I think um, uh, it's fair to say that uh, the, the response is varied but invariably uh, anti-imperialist movements, so, I mean it, it, all of the ones that I talk about in the book, most of them, uh, you know, at least most of them, have had to deal with the question of racism within the United States. Whether that was because um, the armed forces was filled with uh, southern, you know, white supremacist crackers sort of being sent into Haiti or something um, to, you know, murder um, uh, black people, uh, or whether that was because the war was a sort of an expansion of the slaveocracy uh, in the South, or whether it was because, um, you know, uh, the, the ideology justifying the war, and this was very important, um, you know, uh, was, uh, you know, racist and white supremacist in itself. I mean, this all, always came up. Um, so, for example, uh, in the context of the anti-colonial movements, uh, in, and simultaneously in the context of the civil rights struggle in the United States, uh, the, the, the impact that this had on the consciousness, on the outlook, on the uh, ways of perceiving, perceiving the world that young uh, particularly young, younger generations had, but not just them, um, but growing layers of activists had uh, on the world was extremely important to their activism in terms of the anti-Vietnam uh, war struggle. Because if you've just been fighting uh, to uh, overthrow uh, you know, white supremacy in the South, and you know that your state is not your friend, because you've just had these guys shooting guns at you, putting water hoses at you, Ha, uh, you know, covering up your murder or lynching or whatever, you know for, uh, for sure that your state is not on your side, but you also know that it's um, a racist organization. And further, you, you know that when you're looking abroad, you're seeing a group of people who, um, you know, are fighting for rights that you yourself would claim, but they just don't happen to have the right skin color, they don't happen to have the right nationality. Um, you know, they happen to have the wrong ideology or something for, for, for one reason or another. But whatever it happens to be, 
um, you know, this was an extremely important development. I mean, anti-racist consciousness was extremely important in terms of getting people to see that uh, the, the Viet Minh had a right to fight the, the struggle for independence. I'm not saying that uh, that was the conclusion automatically reached by the vast majority of the American people. Uh, by no stretch of the imagination, but a, a sufficient core of activists were convinced of this, um, and uh, you know they uh, that that really had to do with coming to terms with not just the imperialist past of America, but also uh, its domestic uh, sort of uh, history of Jim Crow and of slavery, uh, and the you know the the failures of colorblind liberalism. Uh, you know the idea that if we if we don't notice racism, it'll just go away. Um, you know, so um, the question of Islamophobia today is extremely essential because I mentioned the the tendency of liberalism to de degenerate into barbarism. Uh, well, you know, what is the main way in which it does so today? It's through this uh, clash of civilizations language. It's through the language of Samuel Huntington and Robert Kagan. Um, taken up and uh, refined only to a certain extent by people like Michael Ignatieff and the, the late uh, Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm, I'm writing a book about him, by the way. It's coming out in April. So, uh, um, yes, uh, 50,000 words of file. Um, the, um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the Islamophobia became the sort of discourse through which they articulated this uh, grievance, this idea these people haven't done as they were told. They were supposed to help us build a liberal democracy in their backyard, a Jeffersonian democracy, and somehow they're not doing it. Why not? Um, must be to do with Islam, you know. And essentially, uh, th this is um, a part of the problem because unlike other anti-war movements recent in recent history, there really wasn't much of a relationship between anti-war movements in the US and insurgent movements in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now you can understand why that was. Certainly in Afghanistan, the insurgency oriented around a sort of Taliban force, very right-wing, very fundamentalist, not something that the American left would really want to be associated with. So, you know, on the other hand, of course, uh, you know, the, um, uh, you know, it wasn't just the Taliban in Afghanistan. I mean, actually, you know, we know from all sorts of uh, scholarly studies, often carried out by organizations that are very pro-empire, or at least pro-intervention, um, that, uh, you know, these forces that are assembled behind, the, you know, that go under the label of the Taliban are actually much broader. You know, they're often they're farmers who've had their crops destroyed by Dincor, or who, uh, you know, whose wives or the children or whatever have been destroyed uh, by bombardment, or who've seen, you know, the local town uh, you know, emptied out um, by a, a sort of uh, a, a gunfight, um, and so, you know, they, I mean, these are very much broader social forces, and that means that we have to start to overcome the uh, demonology. And you know, I don't know if you noticed this, but in the height of the Iraq War, there was a revelation in the Washington Post. I think it was the Washington Post, which uh, talked about um, they got hold of some uh, slides uh, from the Pentagon, which was all about how to win hearts and minds uh, in Iraq. Um, and the argument was essentially that we have to leverage uh, uh, you know, xenophobia uh, in, in Iraq. In other words, we have to make them believe that the insurgency is some foreign thing. Uh, for, you know, they, they use this language, uh, what was it, foreign mercenaries, foreign something, foreign fighters, that's the, that's the term. Um, I, you know, like, uh, cheek. Um, but they, they use, sorry? Yes. Indeed, and and you know they they use this um, this language, uh, but they also used it domestically in the U.S. as well. You know, it, it wasn't just they were foreign fighters; it, it's that they were you know the wrong kind of foreign fighters. They were jihadis, they were Al Qaeda, they were Muslim head choppers. You know, this is what people came to believe about the insurgency in Iraq. Now I've seen these statistics. I don't know if you've all seen them, but the Pentagon put them out. I don't believe they're lying. They show that the not on this occasion. <laughs> this is one of those uh, cases of evidence against interest. Uh, they showed um, that uh, the vast majority of attacks in Iraq were directed against U.S. troops or uh, their, um, you know, th their Iraqi sort of subsidiaries, if you like, um, Iraqi police or security forces. So it was about 70% against U.S. troops, and a, a further 25% against uh, uh, Iraqi sort of security forces. And that would include forces like the Wolves Brigades, you know, the Special Police Commandos, extremely repressive forces. You know what these guys did? 
they, I mean, they, after a good day of drilling people to death, they called up the hospital, the morgue uh, in Baghdad, and said, you know what, um, you can keep the plastic handcuffs if you like, we don't need those, they're quite cheap, but uh, the metal handcuffs are too expensive to replace, so can you return them please? From the bodies that they picked up, you know, that's how brazen they were. And this, uh, these were the kinds of forces that were being targeted, I'm, I'm saying. So, they, you know, you had uh, an insurgency that was um, really rooted in uh, Iraqi nationalist uh, sort of sentiment, a, a, resist, a rejection of the occupation, a rejection of U.S. imperialism, and it was far more cellular um, and fragmented and decentralized than previous insurgencies, certainly, you know, than the Viet Minh or the Sandinistas or anything like that. Um, and for that very reason, it was much easier for the U.S. government to give them a face and give them a name and say, uh, you, your leadership is Abu Musab al-Sarqawi, you know, even though al-Sarqawi represented a few hundred, you know, ragtag fighters, you know, basically, you know, uh, ultra sort of jihadis, uh, you know, really, who had little bases in Iraq. Uh, nonetheless, from about 2003, I think it was late 2002, they decided that Abu Musab al-Sarqawi was the connection between Iraq and al-Qaeda. And they decided very early on that he was leading the resistance. And we, can, we know that that's not true, and actually that so-called foreign fighters comprised about 5% of the total insurgency forces. Um, it probably, I mean, that was a CIA estimate, so maybe it's even you know, less than that, we don't know. But the point is that uh, there was a real, um, genuine, authentic rebellion against uh, US imperialism here, and that was being obscured by these uh, uh, techniques of Islamophobia, of saying that, uh, you know, Essentially, uh, Muslims are fungible. They're all essentially the same kind of thing. They all blend into one another. They all cut people's heads off and they do this, that, and the other. Therefore, you can't possibly support a movement based on Islam, or that which uses Islam as a legitimizing motif. Um, and that was, uh, I think, disabling. I, I think it, uh, the, because, you know, when there are arguments about this, uh, inevitably, the, you know, the uh, government or the media are going to come, come at you as an anti-war person and say, uh, but surely you support the troops. And I think any self-respecting anti-imperialist would want to say, yeah, like a rope supports a hanging man. Uh, we, uh, we support the troops when they resist US imperialism, but we don't support them when they're killing Iraqis or uh, Vietnamese or whomever. Uh, and actually we support the right of those uh, people who are conquered uh, and who are being occupied to resist and to shoot at them. It makes it much harder to do so if everybody believes that this resistance um, is, uh, you know, some sort of barbaric throwback to some, uh, uh, you know, uh, medieval uh, tyranny. So um, this um, it, it is an extremely important, actually I think this is the crux of, um, uh, you know, imperialist ideology today and it's what, you know, we have to resist, not just because of the effects that it has in terms of US society and all our societies domestically, but because of what uh, it uh, has validated, the barbarism that it has justified and validated, and uh, what uh, damage it can do uh, in the future. Um, I'll, I could go on, but I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, again, thank you to Richard Seymour for giving a great, great talk to us. And before we wrap up, if you're willing to donate a few dollars to help with travel expenses, uh, there's a box in the back, yes, and Amanda wants to make an announcement. Hi, I'm Amanda. I just wanted to make an announcement about Haymarket Books. It's a nonprofit, progressive publishing company. Um, we think that ideas are weapons, and in the struggle for fighting for a better world, we need to arm ourselves with the history and the politics to really learn from learn the lessons from the past and apply them to today. Um, and also on everyone's chair, um, there's a brochure. Haymarket is sponsoring Socialism 2012. It's a conference happening in Chicago. Um, last year, over 1,500 people came out for it. Um, it's um, just a national, uh, it's a gathering of radicals from all over the country. Um, I think now more than ever there's an urgency for us to really come together, take up the big questions that we're facing, especially since Occupy. It's like how do we actually move forward? How do we confront imperialism? How do we take up issues like education and austerity? Um, and this is like the perfect opportunity to really like come together and discuss these things. Um, and yeah, there's just just want to like 
tell you a couple talks like From Black Power to the New Jim Crow, Stuff on Imperialism, A History of U.S. Imperialism, Israel's Apartheid State, the Bradley Manning case, the New War and Women. Um, so yeah, I encourage folks, we're taking a bus from Boston. If you're interested, come talk to people at the Haymarket table. Also check out the books. Um, yeah, and thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Richard. also emphasize this book is on sale over there too so you really should go over there and um, make sure you pick up the Boston Occupier as well I know not all the seats were filled but take the spare one and give it to a friend when did, when did this issue come out last week went last Wednesday and um, this event was all recorded so be sure to share it with your friends it will be available on this Howard Zinn Memorial Lecture Series website zinlectures.wordpress.com I'm certain it will be available on Lennon's Tomb and everywhere around the web. And thank you again for coming.